Good afternoon, everyone. I'm incredibly excited and honored to be here this afternoon to serve as your moderator for our closing ARM 2020 plenary titled Structural Racism in Health Services Research, Honest Reflections on Our Role and Path Forward. My name is Rachel Hardiman and I'm an Associate Professor and Blue Cross Endowed Professor of Health and Racial Equity at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health in the Division of Health Policy and Management. And this session came out of some fantastic discussions with ARM planning co-chairs, with Academy Health Leadership, the Disparities Interest Group, and other critical leaders in the field. And I want to thank each of them for their efforts and vision in putting this closing plenary together. As many of us watched in horror as George Floyd was murdered by a Minneapolis police officer on May 26th, and as we grapple with the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities, we have found ourselves in a moment and what we do next as a field and as a discipline will be the difference between this being a moment where the devaluing of black and brown bodies continues or a turning point where we are revolutionary in our thoughts and actions and become anti-racist. This panel was intentionally crafted to represent each of the important sectors and roles within the field of health services research so that we might collectively and individually reflect analyze and discuss a plan for forward movement together. So we're fortunate today to have with us some of the key leaders in our field from academia, funders, one of the top journals in the field, and of course, our own professional organization, Academy Health. So I will start by introducing each of our panelists briefly and asking them to take a couple of minutes to share some opening thoughts and opening remarks with us. And after our panelists um, share their opening remarks, we'll pause for a mo moment to respond to a poll. Those of you who have participated in the opening plenary and the plenary yester yesterday, moderated by um, Dr. Taylor, will be familiar with the poll in question. And I think it's important as we reflect on our path forward um, to know where we are as a field and as a discipline. And I think um, this polling question helps us to um, offer some important insight into that. So I appreciate your participation. So first I'd like to um, introduce our first panelist, esteemed panelists. Um, I won't be able to do all of these amazing folks' bios any justice in the time we have because we really are hoping to have a robust discussion with all of you. Um, so please feel free to you know, look up their bios if you, if you would like more information. Um, but our first panelist is uh, Dr. Nikayla Cook, who is the exec executive director at the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI. She's a cardiologist and health services researcher uh, with a distinguished career leading key scientific initiatives engaging patients, clinicians, and other healthcare stakeholders at one of the nation's largest public health research funders. Uh, so welcome, Nikayla. Thank you for being with us, and we'd love to hear some opening remarks from you. Thank you so much, Rachel, and what a privilege it is to be here to join this um, really important discussion. And as I reflected on um, the topic of today's dialogue, um, I wanted to emphasize the fact that structural forms of racism and their relationship to health and healthcare inequities and effective solutions still remain really understudied. And as a research funder, I think this is an important contribution we can make as we look at today's dual public health crises that you mentioned of violence, as well as the coronavirus pandemic, which are just disproportionately claiming the lives of people of color. And this focus on and public attention on factors like structural racism and implicit and explicit bias that serve as root causes for health and health care disparities have just put to the fore the important and critical role that we have to play in identifying solutions to these persistent and pervasive challenges. And at PCORI, one of our national priorities is eliminating disparities in health and health care outcomes. And we're amid a re-examination of those national priorities as we prepare PCORI to meet the health issues and needs of today and tomorrow, especially those of the issue of structural racism as a root cause of health and health care disparities. But in order to do so, research is really needed that starts to deconstruct the social construct of race and really seeks to further understand and to intervene even upon these complex multi-component drivers of outcomes that are represented in this variable of race, including some of our traditionally studied issues of environment and socioeconomic factors, 
But I think the importance now is thinking about structural systemic racism, discrimination, and bias, and its biological and socioeconomic implications. And we're examining and re-examining our portfolio and funding portfolio, trying to identify and consider the ways that we can move toward el elimination of racism or bias in our funding processes. And that includes issues related to the pool of applicants or even the review process we use in terms of reaching funding decisions, funded awards, and even participation in the research enterprise by diverse participants. So to drive this lasting change, it really is going to require urgent and collective action. And that's why I'm really, really happy to be part of a dialogue today and hope that we can come up with some solutions that we can share and learn from each other for this next phase of what's going to be really important in health services research. Thank you so much, Nikayla. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Thomas Leviste who is Dean and Professor Weatherhead Presidential Chair in Health Equity at Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. Dr. Levis seeks to develop an orienting framework in the development of policy and interventions to address race disparities and health-related outcomes. His specific areas of expertise include the U.S. health and social policy, the role of race in health research, social factors contributing to mortality, longevity, and life expectancy, as well as quantitative and demographic analyses and access and utilization of health services. Welcome, Thomas, um, and uh, we look forward to your opening remarks. Yes, yes thank you, Rachel, and thank you for um, inviting me to participate in this important conversation. We're at a what feels like an inflection point, what I hope is an inflection point, but what we do know is that we're at a point in the evolution of our country where people are listening and where there is an opportunity for us to create change. Structural racism is four centuries in development. And I think that for, if we're going to respond in a way that we really will have this inflection point that we have the potential to bring about, we will only be able to do that if we bring it about, not through incremental change, but by bold initiatives, bold change, changes that will bring down those structures, which means that we need to look at every aspect of the work that we do within the various sub areas of health services research represented by the, uh, the panelists on this, on, this, um, on this important panel, and be willing to be vulnerable enough to look closely at those sacred cows within our fields and, and within our work that, um, that are also formed with this structural racism at its foundation and be willing to take down those sacred cows and move away from them and move towards a new, more hopeful future and a more equitable future. So I look forward to listening and also contributing to this conversation about how we can make the bold changes necessary to make this society the equitable society that we have the potential to be. Thank you so much, Thomas. Our next panelist is Alan Wheel, who is the Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs, the nation's leading health policy journal. He's also an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and recently completed a term as an appointed member of the Medicaid and CHIP Payment and Access Commission, MACPAC. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Alan. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you for leading this really important discussion. Uh, we at Health Affairs feel very much a part of the ecosystem that needs to fundamentally re-examine its role and its behavior if we're going to be anti-racist and tear down many of the barriers that have been built up literally over centuries. Uh, when I think about our role, I think of three domains, and we'll probably expand on these as our time goes by. First of all, we're a publication uh, resource. We want to be the platform for scholarship on these critical topics. We have a long history of publishing in the area of uh, both peer-reviewed articles, as well as some very interesting commentary on our blog. And we want to continue to be a place where this conversation can occur. But we need to look internally as well. And that's, as uh, others have noted, that's the harder part. And there, uh, this is a journey. Uh, we've, st we've started it uh, almost a year ago, but there are two domains that I'd highlight at the outset. One has to do with our uh, author and reviewer pool. Uh, there's a very clear pathway of mentorship of leading institutions that uh, provide the infrastructure and the uh, often the financial resources to enable people to participate in a process that, frankly, is not paid typically. So you have to get the resources somewhere. 
that just reinforces existing structures of institutions that are dominant in our environment and keeps others out. And we are undertaking an active effort to identify barriers to participating as authors and reviewers in institutions that have not been well represented, particularly uh, uh, institutions that are minority serving. And so that's, a, that's a, an active change as opposed to being passive and just taking what comes our way. The other very complex area that I'll just tee up quickly is the question and issue of methods. Um, our readers in the health sector love quantitative results. The media loves quantitative results. This policy led to that many dollars, this many lives saved. Quantitative work is central to our, uh, our field and needs to continue. Um, but it buries the voices of many, uh, partly due to small numbers, partly due to the distance, the lack of story behind the data that are often presented. And we heard a lot about that in the other, earlier plenaries on this topic, so I won't repeat it. I think we need to take a serious look at how we can broaden the methods that are covered in the journal, because I do think our emphasis and our field's emphasis on quantitative methods is a subtle form of reinforcing uh, the uh, racial barriers that have uh, that that continue to exist. Thanks, Alan. And last but not least, um, I'd like to introduce um, someone who probably doesn't need an introduction in this space, um, um, Dr. Lisa Simpson, who has been the president and CEO of Academy Health since 2011. Um, Dr. Simpson is nationally known and recognized as a health policy researcher and pediatrician and is a, is pas a passionate advocate for the translation of research into policy, policy and practice. Her research in over 90 articles and commentaries in peer-reviewed journals focuses on the role of evidence and data to improve health and healthcare, particularly for children in vulnerable populations. Thank you so much, Lisa, for um, uh, serving on this panel with us. No, oh, and thank you, Rachel. Uh, I want to echo um, what the other panelists and my, my colleagues have said of how important this conversation is, not just because of its content, but because I think we want to make sure that it's that uh, in the roles that we play in our respective organizations, we're also modeling how to have these conversations. So because they need to happen very systematically across our field. So in, in thinking about today's panel, I, I reflected on on how Academy Health and our various communities have long been a place where health equity research, disparities, and social determinants have been discussed and studied and presented and translated. Um, and I think we've made contributions there as a field and as an organization. But clearly, we haven't gone far enough. And as I said earlier in my blog, I really think that we have this opportunity, as Thomas alluded to now, that there's an opportunity to actually look inward, not to say how the rest of the world can and should change in terms of their policies, practice and practices and structures, but how we must change and how we can change. And so as I think about Academy Health's role, Alan already alluded to some of you know the ways the journal thinks about it and Nikayla with, with funding, I think Academy Health, we have really three opportunities to, or three levels of you know, power or influence. And the first is obviously within our organization and, and how we are as a, an anti-racist organization that is in, inclusive and welcoming. The second um, is really as we think about the processes that we have you know, domain over, control over, which shape um, how our field engages with us. And that's, you know, from our governance, through the leadership of committees, to award programs, a whole host of, of processes and policies that we have been examining and we need to look at more. And then the third, um, area even greater is that we also have a role as a thought leader and trying to push the field and also advocacy for change. And so how, how do we take on what is our voice? What should it be as we think about racism, racial justice, um, and what we can do as part of an overall collective effort to really tackle and, and, and actually make a difference? Okay, thank you so much. Um, Lisa and to all your panelists for those opening remarks. Um, I think now we will launch the poll and I encourage all of you out there to take a couple of minutes and respond to our polling question. 
Um, which is how would you describe yourself when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion? Um, again, it's a familiar question that we've asked across a few of the plenaries now. And also um, take a couple of minutes to start queuing up your questions. Um, I'll offer a few questions for our panelists to get us started, uh, but we really, really want to um, create as much of an interactive virtual session as possible um, because this is a topic that you know I think a lot of people are interested in and activated about, and so we want to um, really have a conversation today. Great. So um, some of you may still be responding to the poll, but I think we'll launch into our, our first question um, that I'm going to pose to all of our, our panelists. And it's an intentionally sort of broad uh, question because I think um, responses will be different across you know, the different sectors that are represented. And also it will kind of lead us down some various pathways as we um, as the conversation unfolds. So. Um, you know, I think we're, we're all certainly individuals uh, working in our respective institutions, our systems, and um, within our discipline. Um, and so, of course, there's individual work to be done to become anti-racist. And I think we've heard a lot about that both, um, you know, here within ARM 2020 and also out in the popular media. There's a lot of discussion in that space right now. But we also have to be simultaneously thinking about um, the institutional transformation that we want to see happen and that we want to lead as, you know, sort of leaders in this field. And so so I'm wondering, what um, what does that look like for each of you, both personally um, and as leaders in your current organizations? I think we got a little snippets of that from, from folks in their opening remarks, but I really would love to lay out, are there any elements or sort of nuggets that um, you feel like can be shared and passed along? Or what are you thinking about? What are the steps that you are um, taking as leaders in your organizations um, in this work? And why don't, well, if there's someone who wants to jump in and start, so that's great. Also, I'm, I'm happy to randomly pick someone. <laughs> um, I, I don't mind starting, Rachel. This is Alan. Um, I am really fortunate to serve as a trustee of the Consumer Health Foundation in Washington, D.C., which has a laser focus on racial equity and justice. And I've learned more from being on that board than any book I've read. And I, I won't try to summarize it, but I, as I try to bring what we've done in that board to my organization, the piece that I, that I am most drawn to is the importance of personal connection, creating a pathway for honest discovery. Uh, we have to be vulnerable. That comes up often. And in order to be vulnerable, we have to feel safe. In order to be safe, we have to recognize each other's humanity. And it is striking how in a workplace, it is possible to interact with people every day, every week, but not really see their humanity. And I, I know we want to cover a lot, but I'm going to tell you something that I found interesting. As we've moved, of course, into a no office work environment, uh, we used to have staff meetings every week, every other week. We now do them every week. And on off weeks, all we do is share one topic that everyone talks about something about themselves, a pet a favorite activity, a something like that. We have become closer as a team by doing that than we have in years. I know that's not the end, don't get me wrong, but I do think it's the beginning. If we don't start from human connection, we can't make the next step. And I, that's where, uh, that's, anyway, that's that's my, my opening take on this. Uh -huh. Well, I'll go next. I, I, I like Alan's answer because I do think a big part of what makes racism able to flourish is the fact that we may all live in the country, but we experience the country in a very different way because we are so racially segregated. Because the country is such a segregated country, we don't have those personal interactions with each other. So it's more difficult for some people to see the common humanity of all people. But I think the next step is just as racism is embedded in structures that, uh, that no longer require individuals to hold racist values or beliefs in order to produce racially disparate outcomes, I think that we need to embed anti-racism in structures in the same way. 
while we strip out racism, racism from, the, from the structures. And so in my role as a leader and academic, um, an, an academic leader, what I'm looking at is ways that we can look, uh, change the accrediting um, standards for schools of public health and to embed in those standards the issue of health equity so that it moves from being the course, the elective course that people take because they have an interest in it, but becomes part of the core curriculum of what it means to get training in public health. Because the public health workforce of the 21st century in the United States is a workforce that will be working with a diverse population. What COVID has taught us, if we didn't already know it, and what what's the unracial unrest resulting from uh, George Floyd's murder, lynching, has taught us, if we didn't already know it, is that the consumers of the work that we do are disproportionately black and brown people. It is also the case that the knowledge creators in our field are disproportionately not black and brown people, and the workforce is not. And I don't think that that is an acceptable um, condition, that we, that's a condition that we should find acceptable. So not only do we have to increase the diversity of the workforce, but we also have to change the training of all who go into the workforce and embed within the core curriculum, not the elective courses, the core curriculum, the competencies that are necessary to be functional in the 21st century. And if you're not prepared to deal with a diverse workforce, you frankly are not competent to do this work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Thomas. I'd um, like to chime in next, Rachel, and um, sure. really inspired by Tom's comments and Alan's comments. And, you know, individually as a, a Black woman and um, director of a research funding organization, I personally recognize the privilege and opportunities that have been afforded to me and that are not there for everyone. And I think I feel that personal responsibility to committing to what we can do from our vantage point. And for me, it's really about continuing to elevate the issues and as a research funder have the opportunity to push for innovative and bold ideas and solutions. And I find it important that um, within our organization and external to the organization that we acknowledge the legacy of racism, the challenge and, and the acceptance of the difficulty really in studying it and pressing for the best minds to put their heads together for solutions. And, you know, I, I tell the story that I was born and raised in Bessemer, Alabama, just outside of Birmingham. And from a very young age, I really did recognize that um, there were differences in community health and terms like health disparities and social determinants of health hadn't even really been raised. And I probably didn't even know all the implications of structural racism at that time. But I had the fortune of thinking about an opportunity to, motivated by those disparities, go to medical school and train as a cardiologist and health services researcher. And soon I had to face those difficult decisions about how was I going to work to decrease the issues of health disparities and think about mitigating that and bringing that together with my clinician and researcher passions. And um, you know, I think that in such leadership positions as we have the fortune of having now, we actually have the opportunity to direct efforts and reach many, many people um, that we wouldn't have had opportunity to do in other roles. And so for me, addressing racism and research and thinking about patient outcomes is a personal interest. And it's important to me that um, what I witnessed in cities like Bessemer or Birmingham, or even some of the urban centers like Boston, where I train, that your zip code and your skin color shouldn't always influence your health outcomes. And what can we do in building on a culture of diversity and inclusion to think about how we accomplish our mission and improve healthcare delivery and outcomes for everyone? Because that's what the research is really all about. And um, while we try to do that through funding high integrity research, we have issues in the way in which the research enterprise operates. And um, I think those have been well documented. We recognize that in the literature, there are differences in funding rates, differences in applicant pools, differences in the way review occurs for individuals from different backgrounds. And so I think we have the opportunities to experiment in that application evaluation process, 
think about how we can review and address the bias that we're seeing in those processes and think about as well how we can leverage things like engagement and research to really elevate communities of colors as partnership and as partners in research and um, try to diversify the type of work that we're doing and the diversify the inputs on how we're thinking about the work that we're doing. Um, so I, I think this is a moment for us all to do this kind of internal reflection of how we personally and as um, leaders of the institutions that we represent in health services research, what we can do in our own from our own vantage points. Thanks so much, Daniela. And I think you, you made a few important points there that we're going to want to circle back to. I know there's a question around what funders specifically should be doing. So, um, but next we'll move to uh, Lisa. I think. Sure. Thank you, Rachel. And, and I'm going to pick up on on some of what folks have already said. Um, and I want to touch on both the individual that you spoke to and and the organizational perspectives because they're they're critically important and linked. And, and I would say that just similar to Alan, um, we've, uh, we've also experienced a different way of being with each other uh, at Academy Health uh, since the pandemic. And I think that um, there's, there's a lot of lesson learned there in terms of the, the humanity we need to bring to, to our work. And I've recognized, or let's say, you know, like many of you, I've learned over the years that how I show up in a conversation or on Zoom or at a conference, you know, makes a big difference difference in my effectiveness as a leader. And, and I will be honest, you know, planning this panel, you know, as a white person of extreme privilege, you know, has made me nervous. Um, and so I'm, I'm really trying to lean into that discomfort and, and use the emotions that it, it brings up in me to, to make me sort of, to propel me forward towards action because, and, and some of those are really, how do I personally listen even more? How do I make sure that I'm listening to different voices, not just the ones I know and I'm comfortable with, even if that is sometimes uh, challenging? Um, and, and how do I, you know, it, use the emotions to to make sure that, as I said in my blog, that health services research seizes this moment and, and make an impact, because I do believe we can make a difference. And so shifting from the personal to the organizational, I kind of alluded to the three levels of action. Uh, I just want to focus on one of them that Thomas spoke about, which is the workforce, because I think that's a critical piece of this. We have had diversity and inclusion initiatives in the whole of the sort of health research, biomedical medical health services research enterprise for you know 20 30 years and the reality is that there hasn't been sufficient progress and health services research is no different and so we're looking across all of our programs about how do we um, not only diversify the numbers of folks who, you know, from different perspectives who come in and stay in our field, but how do they feel welcome? How do we not lose them from their uh, work setting as we're seeing in academics with African-American professors and faculty? And at the same time, how do we equip the equip them with the right tools to do better research as Nikayla spoke to it when they when they use race in a model. So we're, we're gonna be working with our methods and data council, with our education council on those areas. But the final point I wanna mention is because Academy Health is, is, has been working with our board and will be working even more in the coming months to really look at, the, at racism and racial justice across all our programs and services. And it's that kind of systematic, you know, examination or interrogation that we need to do. And, and one of the projects I wanna mention that is also looking at this is the Paradigm Project um, and, and really trying to look differently at the structures of health services research and the incentives behind who gets promoted, how do you know? How do we create a uh, a sustainable health services research community that's going to pr produce the kind of evidence we actually need to completely eliminate um, the uh, the impact of racial justice and, and racism, while making a difference to actually eliminate racism? Thanks so much, for that, Lisa. And it leads, um, you know really nicely into uh, my next question, because I think, you know, when we talk about racism and how to dismantle racism, we really have to interrogate power and think um, very critically about who's in power and what the decision-making processes in these, you know, in our respective organizations look like. Um, and so I'd love for all of you to think about that a little bit and um, and share with us, you know, what um, resources within your respective institutions and how those, um, 
how those might be opportunities for reform. So are there are there resources and opportunities that are distributed equitably within your organization? How might we consider doing that differently? What does power look like? And, um, you know, I think this came up in yesterday's uh, plenary session as well. It's, you know, it's requiring folks to give something up. Right. And I think it's hard for, you know, all of us, whether, whether we, you know, we have multiple forms of privilege or just one form of privilege, giving something up is tough, um, but also a necessary part of this work. And I would love to hear how you all are thinking about that um, within your respective organizations. So I'm happy to start since I was last to bat sort of, <laughs> I, I hate, you know, sports metaphors because I don't do sports, but anyway. Um, so I think it's at every level of power. And so there's different kinds of power in at Academy Health and in our community. So at a, at a basic one level of power is the governance of the organization, because as a you know nonprofit, I listen to my board of directors. And so who gets onto the board of directors? Um, you know, it's based on nominations and engagement. But, you know, while we've been working on diversity of voices and backgrounds, we can do better. So that's one level of power. Another one is the allocation of the resources we do have, which is, you know, real estate on a program at one of our meetings, because that helps your career. It advances you. It helps you network. And so how do we plan our meetings? Who's helping to plan those? How do you get on those committees? How do you join an interest group advisory committee? Because that's often a first step in leadership sort of development. And, and another important aspect that we haven't figured out how, how Academy Health can be, do a better job is the mentoring and sponsorship of individuals, whatever career stage they are at, because this is not a early career only issue. You, throughout my career, I've, I've been fortunate and privileged to get mentoring and, and, and sponsorship. So those are just a couple of examples where we, we think about the resources we actually have at Academy Health that we can use differently and it requires systematic spreadsheet questions follow through transparency and then accountability so you know accountability to our board and accountability back out to our members um i mean this panel came about because some of our members you know the leadership of our disparities ig group rachel others spoke up and said academy health you need to have this conversation and and that's the kind of um relationship that we want to have with our field You know, I, I really love this. I really love this question, and I also love uh, Lisa's answer because I think that's what it what it what it illustrates is that it is it is really all about power and who is in power to allocate resources, which is what leadership is all about. And and when you get into that space where you are in that role where you have the opportunity to allocate resources, what do you do with that? Are you willing to step outside of the normal boundaries and do something that's bold and different? And so what some of the things that I've been working on here um, at Tulane is not only taking a, a relook re at our curriculum, as I talked about earlier, moving the health equity content into the required core curriculum, not continuing to leave it on as an elective for the aficionados who care about the topic and who would probably learn the information whether we offer them a course or not, but to put it in a place where it would not be possible to get a degree from our program without getting that those competencies, but also looking outwardly about resource allocation. So New Orleans is like the rest of America, a dramatically racially segregated uh, city. Not only is it physically segregated in terms of the geography of where people live, but the economies are segregated. You have black banks and you have white banks and you have black churches and you have white churches and it goes on and on and on just like the rest of the country. So as uh, as a leader within uh, the largest um, uh, private employer in the city, one of the things that we've done was to open accounts, have the university open an account in the black bank. Well, that's moving those assets and those resources to into the black community here in New Orleans and giving the black community an opportunity to get the economic development that comes from that. Um, the black bank is more likely to loan, to, to make loans for mortgages in black communities, more likely to support businesses develop opening in those black communities. And it's a way that an organization that is, an, is, is as important to the economy of our city and state to be able to have its tentacles spread more widely than it traditionally had been and to have a bigger impact. 
And what we need is leaders who will who will who will take those types of bold steps and move beyond the normal traditional way of doing things. I'd um, also like to chime in on this question because I think it is such a great question and great responses thus far. And you know, when I think about power. Um, at PCORI and who has that power and how is it distributed or allocated. Um, our power and decision-making resources, I think in some ways follow some of Lisa's answer as a nonprofit um, that is also um, funding um, research applicants. And as a funding institution, a lot of that power allocation um, happens or happens through the application process where we just talked about some of the issues there and um, you know this the concept of racial exclusion that's really been a legacy of racism um, that uh, results in challenges in the diversity of our applicant pool as well as the bias implicit or explicit that may occur through a funding process and um, although I just joined PCORI four months ago um, I think that this is this a specific area where we anticipate um, the need to have in-depth understanding and review and extensive analyses. And I think um, Lisa said it quite well when she talked about an intentional and structured process that will allow us to understand our funding of applicants and recipients and to determine if we've had successes in certain spaces and reaching a diverse and inclusive research community or where we need to identify the gaps and address them. And we anticipate um, completing some of this work over the course of this year and next. And um, I would also like to say internally, in terms of thinking about Cori as an organization, organization. We're um, in this new phase of thinking about our next 10 years with um, reauthorization behind us and 10 years of funding ahead of us and are taking a step back and looking at our organizational assessment and making sure that our staffing and resources are aligned for the future. And part of this collaborative process with our board and our staff is also looking at the issues of equity and diversity within PCORI and thinking about how we align for the future in a way that really reflects the PCORI that we want to be. And so I, I would say that's a, another space internally where we recognize the opportunities to, to do something very different. And then lastly, I was just going to point out um, there's something that we do a little bit differently at PCORI when it comes to research funding. We are um, very interested in the engagement of communities, and I think this offers another opportunity for us to think about um, the the allocation of power and where it exists and thinking about how we engage communities that have had long-standing issues of structural racism and limited opportunities and have been structural racism has promoted exclusion and to be focused and intentional in that meaningful engagement as well and enhance that outreach and think about how we bring those communities and institutions that um, will diversify engagement in the research process itself. And I think it's our time to double down on these efforts. Thanks so much, Nikayla. Um, Alan, before we jump to you, I just wanna um, share, as I've, as I've been looking at some of the audience questions, um, folks are really interested in um, sort of some um, identifying, having you all identify sort of very um, specific uh, structural level action that you know people can take in their respective organizations. And I think Michaela um, and Thomas and Lisa, you've offered some of that in your remarks in response to this last question. Um, and so Alan, uh, related to that, folks are interested in hearing about um, health affairs and the recently posted position that, that you've made around addressing diversity and, and thinking about um, what the resources allocated to that position look like and um, what other structural changes are being thought about um, at health affairs. So as you sort of think about the power and the decision-making piece, um, if you can offer some insight there, that would be wonderful. That's great. I don't want to take too much time. Uh, first of all, I totally agree with you that this is about power. I wrote uh, to that effect in a blog uh, called The Social Determinants of Death that I wrote in, in uh, back in June. Um, when I think about our power, it does harken back a bit to what Lisa said. We are agenda setters. So part of our power is saying what's important. What should people read? If we publish it, people believe it's credible, but also important. And so making space for this conversation uh, is, is a critical element of our power. A much more subtle element, and this gets a little bit more, I think, to the question you just asked, is that 
you know, professional advancement in our field comes through many things, but one of them is successful publication and a key publication in that ecosystem is health affairs. So part of our power is the selection of papers that we choose to review and that we say pass a certain threshold that can through the review process be brought into a form that we are prepared to present to the world. Well, that's a form of power that we concentrate on a limited number of papers because we have limited resources. So tying back to the last question you asked, a critical part, we, we developed an equity project back in late 2019. Uh, we do have, thankfully, in September, uh, starting a new person who's gonna direct this project. I'm very excited. It took us a while to recruit because we had so many people interested. But this is about outreach to share the power and resources that we have of improving health services research intentionally with people who would not necessarily enter our ecosystem or frankly make it through our gates. And I hate to use that term because it's a physical term, but it is sort of true. So just to put a little ribbon around this, if because we have a very low acceptance rate because so many people submit articles, the vast majority of papers submitted get a reject and the author gets nothing from it other than we're sorry. What we're trying to do is identify papers of merit that have the potential to bring in new voices that maybe would take a little more effort or require a little bit more work than we would typically be prepared to devote to editing and say we are going to actively bring those into the process as well so that Hopefully they make it all the way to the end and it makes it into onto someone's CV. But even if not, there's a learning and engagement experience and we're sharing the knowledge we have about how to be a health services researcher who produces things that will be successful in health affairs. There are many other directions to go, but that's probably the best uh, short uh, answer to the question. Can you speak for a minute, Alan, on how that how, how that works with the reviewer process as it currently stands? I think you you spoke or alluded to a little bit of that in your opening remarks, but we have, you know, as we think about um, our academic institutions and what's required for tenure and also in the service of reviewing, um, what does that look like in this in this new um, initiative? So, we are learning. I'm, I'm going to say that a hundred times. We are learning. The primary job of my new director is going to be to help us identify where we are, because we don't collect these data, but then also to reach out to institutions that we know produce high quality work that is not making its way into our pages and understand by speaking to people, what are the barriers to submission? What are the barriers to volunteering to be a reviewer? How do we overcome those barriers? We have to because when so many people come to you, it's easy to say, we just pick the best. Merit is a merit is a lovely term, but it reinforces the existing power structure. So we have to say, wait a minute, we're going to think about the process differently and actively solicit participation by people uh, who otherwise might have felt that we were not open to them. That's going to be a multi-year complex process. We are going to be pushed to move in directions that we don't even know. And we're going to have to bring our readers along and they may or may not be open to the task. But that is what we are going to do. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so circling back to um, sort of the question I posed before Alan started speaking about sort of identifying one new structural level action. Um, is there anything else that, um, that folks would want to add to that? I think some of them have been laid out, you know, Thomas, you talking about investing in or, you know, uh, make, creating relationships with black owned banks, I think is a great example of that. Are there others um, within your respective spaces that you would like to share? Well, I think I, I'm hesitating because we haven't figured this all out yet. And so um, to, to Alan's point, it is a journey. And one of the things we have committed to do, it's not a change in a structure, but is actually to, um, to use the Aspen Institute's racial 
equity theory of change model and workshop to actually convene a group of experts and both inside and outside of health services research to help work through exactly where are the highest leverage points in that theory of change for our field that we could ex execute on so that we're you know we, we've been thinking and discussing with our senior staff a lot around you know, um, how do we take the resources we do have, and it, we're all in a world of limited resources, and use them for greatest impact in addressing racism. So, so that's what. So that's sort of where we are on that part of the journey. Uh, the one structural um, thing that we, you know, had started just before this conversation today but was systematizing a process that has been informal within Academy Health, which is because we ask for every panel, for every invitational meeting, what's the diversity along a whole dimension, discipline, expertise, race, geography, work setting, you know, we have those names, but it's not systematized. So we're creating a database of those names of folks engaged with Academy Health. And so we know when to call on them and keep growing it. Another area we're trying to figure out is while we're pretty good at being systematic on all those committees I talked about, we never get enough theme reviewers. And, and often that's a first thing you do for the annual for Academy Health is review as part of a theme because we need more than 200 every single year. So sort of similar to journals, it's like we have to grow that community and we get we ask for nominations but we just we've got to figure out how to proactively go out and diversify that pool as well um so those are just a couple thoughts but again we're, we're planning on some activities in the next next six months that i hope i'll be able to answer the the question even more specifically afterwards okay thanks lisa and i would love to put in a plug for the racial equity theory of change um Take a look at it, um, audience members, if you're not familiar. I use it um, in the course I teach um, on structural racism and health inequities, and I think it's a great tool to really start start to kind of break down all of the, the multitude of pieces of understanding an issue and uh, charting a path forward. Um, anyone else have thoughts on sort of the identifying these very specific um, sort of structural level action items that you want to share? Yeah. I, I I, I think um, this panel is a perfect example of what I'm what, what I think is uh, another important aspect of this, which is we need to have more people in leadership positions who are thinking about these issues. Right. So most of us and I'm here speaking mostly about the academy now, you know, uh, which is where I'm working. You know, we, we spent our careers speaking truth to power and hoping that the people in power will allocate resources in ways that we think it should happen. I did that for a long time. But I think more of us need to think about moving beyond speaking truth to power, but actually being the person in power, have someone speak truth to you, and then you get to decide how you could will allocate those resources. You know, I thought, why don't I give that a try and see what that's like, and I, I'll tell you, it's you can get much more done when you're in that role, but so many of us you know, in, in academia specifically, so many of us think of that as going to the dark side, whatever that means. I haven't quite figured that out. And we <laughs> don't want, and, and, and we think that there's somehow more noble to be on the side of speaking truth to power. But I think that, you know, we need to start thinking about how do we come to want, become the ones who are, are, are able to make the decisions about how those resources are allocated. And listening to Lisa and Alan and, and Nikita, all of whom are now in leadership roles and who are thinking about how to use that position of power to make to to advance um, an anti-racist agenda. I think that's what we need to be thinking about. And so, how do we then build that next generation of people who will come behind us, so that after um, Alan is no longer editor of, a, of um, Health Affairs, which I know will be a long time from now, but whenever that does happen, that the next editor will not come along and undo all of the good that he's been able to do with the changes he's making. Thanks, Thomas. I think that's a, that's a really important point, and it actually ties um, really nicely into an audience question around, you know, how do we improve capacity of middle managers, um, particularly in universities and large academic um, settings, academic health centers, to um, contribute, you know, certainly to the sustainability piece and, you know, ensuring that the work that's being done um, doesn't get undone. Um, do you have any thoughts or, um, or, or a model for how that might look? You've got to be thinking about mentorship. You've got to always be thinking about who's coming up behind me that I can help to prepare 
so that when it's time to pass the baton, there are some, there's someone to pass that baton to, uh, to. I mean, I think that's an important part of leadership, and I think everyone in a leadership position should be thinking about that. Great, thank you. And if, if I could just quick, sorry, if I could just very quickly say, I think it's very common for people to underestimate how much power they have. It's much more comfortable to think that you can't do anything, and than it is to stretch and do what you can. And I've certainly succumbed to that myself. I'm not pointing any fingers, but I just uh, part of what I said in my blog. You know, we are we're a fifth of uh, we're the fifth largest country in the world if you take the healthcare sector. Uh, if we think we don't have power, like who does? Um, and so we've really got to take seriously how much we have and not give ourselves excuses for, for thinking that we don't. Right. And actually, the comment I was going to jump in with, Alan, kind of builds on that point, which is, um, you know, it, Historically, health services research and academy health came dominantly out of academically based health services researchers. And, and academia shapes the next generation, regardless of where they go work. But let's not forget the you know, tremendous power that are in uh, that is in other healthcare settings and what what we can provide and work with them in terms of shaping the outcomes we, we seek to change. And so I think that power at middle management or leadership is not limited to questions within the academic institutions, but in every sort of organization that plays in that healthcare sector that Alan's referred to, because we're seeing more and more graduates, you know, I mean, the number, the uh, NAM report or NAS report on biomedical sciences showed that for the first time in history a couple of years ago, more PhDs were leaving academia than staying in academia. And so uh, it, it makes it more complicated, but I think it also opens up a number of different levers for change that maybe if we're only thinking about academic institutions would be too limiting. I wanted to add to that, Lisa, it was a great point because um, in the research funding world, you know, it's a different environment in terms of um, we're seeing a lot of individuals like that who um, move from early academia in terms of training into the research funding world. And um, I think that Tom's point around mentorship, and but I also think empowering that middle management layer to be participatory in the way in which we talk about um, power, some inclusivity in our decision making and understanding of context and um, broader issues is part of what I think um, brings people along for that next um, generation of leaders. And so um, I think that that opportunity to, to really um, be there as a partner um, with the, the layer that is working um, with, with you in the organization um, is part of what we can do by um, demonstrating and walking the talk, or I should say walking the walk, talk, talking the talk that um, we think is really important. And so um, I would just add that component of empowering and working together with in partnership that middle layer of our organizations. Thanks, Michaela. Um, so related to that, I have a question around mentoring. I think um, almost everyone has mentioned mentoring in some way, shape, or form as being important. And so, you know, I've been thinking a lot about like what does anti-racist mentoring look like, right? So, so often mentorship, particularly for folks who are marginalized in the academy, falls in on the shoulders of the few underrepresented minority folks that are in that space, which um, you know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be the case, but unfortunately it is. And so, and as we imagine a new path forward, what does mentorship look like in, um, in academy health? What does mentorship look like in, in schools of public health? And I think this also ties nicely into a couple of questions we've gotten around, um, you know, what role do doctoral programs and doctoral program directors and department chairs play in, um, and training this next, um, the, the, the newest uh, folks in our field. So I'll, I'll kiss, jump in um, because this is an area where um, Margot Edmonds, who's our vice president, um, one of our vice presidents, and she, she also runs the Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Minority Engagement, which we the, the board at Academy Health established over five years ago. And um, over those years, we've been uh, funding and supporting a, a diversity scholars network. And the point of the mentoring is 
not only getting people to the meetings and engage, but then making sure that there's the right other people in the room. And so bringing board members in, leaders from Academy Health who are also at the meetings, bringing in organizations who are also needing to recruit more diverse talent. So you have your, it's, it's how we use our network for both engaging the, those who want mentoring and those who can give it. It's not enough. That's my big struggle. It's been good, but it's a lot of effort for a small number of people. It's not scalable for our budget to take that to huge scale. Um, and so, you know, I think we haven't tapped the potential of virtual mentoring. And I'm not sure how to do that because of the point about humanity and trust and feeling safe. And all those things are prerequisites before you get into an honest conversation with somebody and you, you really, you know, reveal yourself, uh, whether you're the mentee or the mentor. So I'd love thoughts from others of, of how to do that at scale. Yeah, thanks, Vincent. Any thoughts from our academic representation, Colin? Okay. Well, you know, I, I, I think the only way to do it at scale is to have uh, enough enough mentors to be able to do that. Because I think an effective mentor mentee relationship is is really not scalable beyond you know a certain number of people that you can effectively mentor and really have an impact. So I think that if we're all thinking this way, though, we're all thinking about how do we replicate ourselves or replicate the lessons that we've learned in someone else so that they can benefit from those lessons. Um, and bring their own uniqueness to to those lessons and use it, go, use it going forward. If we focus on mentoring more than one additional person, then we will start to have an exponential effect. And I think that's the way that we can uh, scale it. Thank you. Any other thoughts um, before we move into our what I believe will be our final question? All right. Lisa, are you? Yeah, sorry. I was just going to say that this is an area, again, that Margo has been working on with our Delivery System Science Fellows Program and looking across different models, the Cl Clinical Scholars Program, um, the current leadership programs that the Robert Johnson Foundation supports. I think there are definitely models of mentoring. And again, we can serve as a you know collector and hub and resource. And um, But I, I want to underscore Thomas's point. That is when we used to do speed mentoring at the annual research meeting, we did that for a few years. Our biggest challenge was recruiting mentors, not the mentees. I just wanted to chime in on one quick point, Rachel, before we um, move on, which is that um, not to forget our peer mentoring. Um, and so one of the things that um, as someone who's had the fortune of having um, several kind of critical mentors at different um, career points in my um, trajectory, that peer mentoring is, is actually one of those um, opportunities that I think sometimes we under, just underplay and sometimes don't remember the importance of and being parts of communities of peer, um, whether it be researchers or people that share a similar passion about the work of um, dealing with uh, racism or health disparities, whatever it may be. And um, I have found that I the sponsorship and the mentorship from my peers has been almost as effective as what we think about in terms of traditional mentoring relationships. That's a really great point. Thank you, Nikayla. So we have a couple of minutes left and I'd love to hear briefly from each of you, um, you know, the, the answer to this question, which is, you know, how do we shift the urgency of this moment into um, a movement? You know, so what does success look like here? I think we've heard a lot of great, a lot of great examples and sort of nuggets for how to do this work and how to move it forward. But how do we know when we have been successful? Um, in our last minute, or actually 30 seconds, my apologies. <laughs> I can um, maybe start, Rachel, which is um, uh, when we don't have this conversation, I think we've been successful. Um, and to some of my um, thinking as I've talked to people across the country and our stakeholders are that um, the imperative we have right now is to really ensure that we're weaving health equity and addressing health inequities and the root causes like structural racism into everything that we do 
and not just as a single point of focus, but across the entire priority um, span that we have at PCORI. And when we don't need to have this conversation, we've been successful, but I think we have a long way to go and continuing to march towards that. Thanks, Michaela. Any other final thoughts, Thomas or Alan, before we turn it over to Lisa for closing? Well, I will uncharacteristically be brief and just say ditto to what Nikhil just said. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I think I think Nikayla captured it perfectly. So I have nothing to add. It was great. It was a great answer. Well, I would like to thank all of you for your time today and sharing your wisdom and for your leadership um, in the field of health services research. Um, and thank you to Lisa and Academy Health for allowing me to moderate this important discussion. I hope it's the first of many to come as we um, chart our way along this path towards um, an anti-racist uh, future. Um, so Lisa, I'll turn it to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel. And, and thank you to you and all of you on this panel for participating in, in hopefully a, uh, an important continued conversation. This is the final session, the final plenary, closing plenary of the 2020 Academy Health Annual Research Meeting. Um, I wanna thank all of our presenters, all of our staff, all of our participants for joining us for our first ever virtual event. But as they sometimes say, but wait, there's more. Uh, we're actually going to be uh, adding content to the annual research meeting. So um, keep watching and thanks you all for joining us.